I'm going to bring a message tonight you've probably never heard before. And I'm going to look at this message, what the Lord has been showing me lately. Actually, this is not original. I heard another preacher preach on this thought, and then I just kind of put some of my thoughts together with it. And, uh, and I believe it. I believe it's something we need to see this evening. As a church... There are sermons and then there are messages, and I consider this a message tonight. And I think every one of us should take it seriously. If you're a Christian here tonight, I want you to take this very, very seriously. Very seriously. And I believe it will help us all tonight if we'll look at it. The story here in Luke 15 is the prodigal son that had went out and wasted his part of the inheritance and had come back home and for time's sake, we'll not read the uh, whole story. Uh, we're going to focus on the situation when the boy got home now in verse number 25. Look at verse number 25. Now his elder son, that's the man here in the story, was in the field. And as he came down, as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto them, unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he, this is the older brother, was angry. He got mad and would not go in. Therefore his, came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments. And yet thou never met, gavest me a kid, made a supper for him, that I make, make, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with us, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meat, now notice that word meat, that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. I don't want to preach to you tonight, and you've got to listen carefully and hold your Bibles open because we'll turn into some scriptures on the subject, when God doesn't seem fair. When God doesn't seem fair. There's a spirit that's killing us in churches in America today, and it's hurting us, and it's called the spirit of fairness. Everywhere you go, people say, this isn't fair. Well, that isn't fair. Your kids say it. Don't your kids say it all the time? One of them gets something. It's not fair. They got to go out. I didn't get to go. Um, you buy one something at the store. It's not fair. She got a candy bar. I didn't get it. How come I didn't get one? Employees say it to the employees. It's not fair. She got a promotion. I didn't get a promotion. Christians say it to each other. It's not fair. It's just not fair. What I want to do is bring you a truth tonight from the Bible. Don't get up and walk out when I say I want to get myself I'm going to prove what I'm going to show you tonight. God is not always fair. And you better thank Him that He's not. Now you listen to me tonight, uh, this truth has really got a hold of me, and this is for our church at this particular time. Everybody in our church needs to hear this message. Now I'm, I'm, I'm certain, you understand what I'm saying tonight, I'm certainly not saying God does anything wrong. But I'm saying the spirit of fairness is not the way God works. God don't work in what we and you call the spirit of fairness. As a matter of fact, when a Christian gets the spirit of fairness in them, they are getting in trouble. The younger brother had gone off and wasted everything he had. 
He come home. The father was so glad to see him, was merciful, wrapped his arms around him, threw him a big party, made a big fuss of him. The elder brother got real angry. You know what he was saying? That ain't fair. You're not treating. Hey, you never done this for me, and I've been here all these years. I've served you from all my life. You've never thought a big shouldn't be for him. He goes off and does that. It's just not fair what he's doing. He was accusing the father of being unfair. Now, we've got a big problem. In our mind, we see things the way we think they should be fair. And if you'll be honest with me tonight, every one of us, from time to time, we'll play to say, well, it's not fair. It's just not fair. Uh, we see it different. We know that Cain started this off way back in the Old Testament when he became a fugitive and God punished him. And you know what Cain said? Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He said, this ain't fair. You're giving, you're, you're being too hard on me. It's just not fair. Korah did it with Moses in the Old Testament when he said it's not fair. God speaks to people other than you, Moses. You think you're the only one God ever speaks to? He's just as real to us as he is to you. It's not fair what you're doing. Joseph's brothers said it to his father when they come in and said, you're not treating us like you treat him. You're real good to him and not good to us. It's just not fair. Job's wife in the Old Testament set Job down and said, Job, you've tried to serve God. You've lived right. You've done everything you know to do that's right. And now God's took everything you've got away from you. It's just not right. God's not done you right, Job. God's not being fair to you. Curse him and die. The atmosphere of our religious tenure today is that we think, listen to me, we think that God has to be fair all the time according to our standards of fairness. But that kind of spirit is an incubator for bitterness. That kind of spirit is an incubator for jealousy. That kind of spirit is an incubator for hatred. And that kind of spirit is an incubator for contempt. And all of that is brewed in what we call here tonight the spirit of fairness. He, this older brother, uh, we would call him a party pooper. Uh, he can't control what his father's doing, and he's mad about it. He wants the handcuffs put on the, the rebellious brother. He don't want uh, a, a party. He, his ways, uh, we've got to remember, are not our ways. God don't always do things the way me and you think they should be done. Now, have you ever thought uh, somebody done something real bad to you or done, done you wrong, and you thought, God, get them for that. And then God don't get them doing nothing. God just blesses them. And deep down inside you think, now something ain't right here somewhere. Why don't God do this? Or why don't God do that? I'm saying you tonight, God don't always operate in what me and you call the spirit of fairness. Now the truth is tonight, the spirit of fairness is of the devil the way me and you look at it. Humanly speaking, the spirit of fairness is not right. I'll give you several reasons and example. Number one, the spirit of fairness in Christians is ruled, ruled by our own opinion. It is ruled by our own opinion. Now you get in serious trouble when you start going by your opinion of things instead of what the Bible says about things. You know what he done? He come in and he said, Daddy, it's not right what you're doing for this boy. This boy don't deserve no party. This boy don't deserve. It's, you, you're doing wrong. He was actually accusing the father of doing wrong. That was his opinion. He had his opinion. He had a right to it. But it was the spirit of fairness that ruled his opinion. You know what he said? He said, I've done right. 
And uh, he said, I feel like that my opinion is the standard for the Father's judgment. And he said, it's my personal opinion. Uh, and the rule, uh, and it robs us of our joy. That boy could have been in there enjoying the party, getting a blessing, having a good time, rejoicing with his friend. But the spirit of fullness in his mind ruined his joy because the Father didn't handle the situation like he thought it should be handled. Amen? Are you listening to me? I get Chris or some other birthday. Chris says, do I get something? I say, no. She says, why? I say, because it ain't your birthday. It's not fair. Yes, it is fair. I'm the father. I decide what's fair. The children don't decide what's fair. The father decides what's fair. The spirit of fairness in Christians is ruled by their own opinion. He gets to do something you don't get to do. Your brother gets to go somewhere you don't get to go. He gets to go out and play. You have to stay in mow the grass. You say it's not fair. Mom and daddy's not being fair. You teenagers are the worst in the world for this sometimes. You say it's not fair. Uh, uh, you know, I had to clean up the kitchen yesterday. Well, it's her turn tomorrow. Yeah, but I, there was more dishes than there was yesterday. It's not fair. Mama says, I'll say what you do here and what you don't do here. The spirit of fairness is a wicked spirit that's ruled by our own opinion. Now, let me say something about God tonight. I'm scared of God. I fear God. I believe it's right to fear God and I believe you're crazy if you don't fear God. I am in God's hands tonight and whatever God chooses to do with me is God's business and God's, and, and God's plan and I or you or nobody else cannot put handcuffs on God Almighty. We can't do it. If He does something we don't think's right, we just go on with it. It's all there to it. He don't always operate according to what we think is fair. Number two, the spirit of fairness is revealed in the need to try to control the uncontrollable. In other words, um, he was mad because his daddy was loving the prodigal son and he was just mad as fire about it. It'd be like, it'd be like when somebody back slid. And they'd been out, and they'd been out uh, in sin. They'd been to church in six months, and it would be just like uh, uh, we come, they come in here, and maybe they ain't been here for six months, and been out, got on drugs, got on alcohol, and then one night they come back to church, and I get up here and preach, and they get under conviction, and they come to the altar, and boy, they just come by the altar, and everybody gets up and hugs them, and hugs their neck, and makes a big fuss over them, and maybe we invite them over to eat, and all that. And then some of you sitting there saying, hey, I come every single morning and they ain't never invited me over to eat. I come and sit here every service and ain't nobody never hugged my neck. Nobody ever. You know what that is? That's a human spirit of fairness. We are mad because we can't control how the Father does. I'll tell you something tonight. If a man's out there living in sin or a woman and she looks out all of and she repents and she it's right with God, however God deals with her and however God deals with him is absolutely none of mine in your business and it doesn't matter if it seems fair to us or not, that's the Father's job, how he treats that individual. He's mad because his dad was loving the poor. Let me, let me just tell you something. Me and my wife have been studying church history together. And I went through a book on William Carey, and then me and her read one on David Livingston, who was a missionary to Africa. And then we got a video out of the bookstore the other night, which all, I recommend all you families get those church history videos and watch them, husband and wives together, on the missionary, or the great uh, man of God, John Huss. John Huss was a man that loved God and stood for the truth. He was in the, in the, in the Catholic Church as a priest 
and he saw the truth that God only justified a man by grace through faith. He said, faith in God makes me right with him. The mass didn't make him right. Confession didn't make him right. Confirmation didn't make him right. Uh, good works didn't make him right. Only by faith in Jesus Christ. This was in the dark ages when they would burn you at the stake for heresy. And John Huss was brought in before what they call the, the hierarchy and, and the cardinals and the, and the king and they brought him in there and they accused him of everything and John Huss didn't even get to defend himself. He never got to tell his side of the story. He wasn't allowed to speak up and God sat in heaven and watched them condemn him and he was in the right and they put up a bunch of stakes like this and they put up like corn stalks and they had him on a big old stake and they put a chain around his neck cause a rope would burn and they put him up there like this and John Huss said Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me and the torches lit those bottom of those like corn husks and they burned him alive and but all he did was stand for the truth does that seem fair? No, it don't. Don't seem fair, does it? If me and you would have been running the show, we would have said, let him tell his side. Let the man go. He's preached the truth. He's innocent. Give him a chance. But they, no, God let him be burned. God allowed it. William Carey took his wife and kids and sailed down a boat into India in the 1700s. He became the father of what's called the modern missionary movement. Listen, I'm talking to you about a man named William Carey who had gone where no man had ever gone before and went for one reason, to preach the gospel. They said when you got there you'd get so sick that you couldn't stand it. You get dysentery. That's diarrhea so bad that many people die from it. You have headaches and vomiting and fever. And most people can never live in a country like that. They sailed down the river. His wife wouldn't even go with him. And she, they tried and tried to talk him to going. And he said, God has called me. I've got to go. And she said, I'm not leaving. I'm staying here. And he said, I've got to go. God's called me to go. And finally they talked to him to going. And she went with her husband. And they got down there on the mission field. And they moved into India. And they were treated terrible. And they had kids. And one of his boys died. And his boys stayed sick. And all he was doing was trying to do right. All he was doing was trying to preach the gospel. And his wife, his wife lost her mind. Little by little, she went crazy. Every time he got the door, she would accuse him of things and say he was lying to her. And she'd scream. And they didn't have asylums to put him in in those days. And they had to lock his wife in a room. And she'd stay in there kicking the walls and beating on the walls, screaming. I'm talking about for years and years while he sat in there and tried to translate the Bible into the language where them people could understand it. I'm telling you tonight the Christian life, it don't always seem fair. You say brother Danny, this ain't fair. What we're having to go through, it just don't seem fair. It's always been like that in church history. But God used William K. to inspire what we call the modern day missionary movement. His wife finally died. And he went on and stayed there and became a great work for God. And it spread and thousands of people were saved because of his work. Looks like God would have took care of him a little bit better than that, don't it? So you watch your prayer tonight, you say, well, it's not fair. Why do I have to get stuck with so-and-so? 
We never was in love to start with and now we're married. we got to stay married because it's right. It's a shame to get a divorce. Man. It's just not fair. That is a spirit that your problem is. It's a wicked spirit called a spirit of fairness. And it's because you cannot control the uncontrollable. What you better do is just thank God that He ain't really being fair with you. And we'll get more of that in just a minute. David Livingston went to Africa. The son, he went down there where they'd never saw a white man's face. And when David Livingston got to Africa, ladies and gentlemen, he got down there and they didn't know him. He couldn't speak their language. He'd go from tribe to tribe. He said we'd go 30 miles. He didn't even know. I mean, there were no maps. They didn't know where water was. They didn't know where people was. And they'd finally go across the desert and they'd see a bunch of trees and they'd say, well, there must be water. And then they found this great river. And they said, if we follow this river, we're bound to find some people. So they followed the river and sure enough, there was a village, there was a village, there was a village, there was a village, there was a village. And he tried to go in and preach to them. And sometimes the, tri- the natives were hostile against them. And they, they, they said, they got down in this one village. Listen, I'm talking about God's people sold out to God, living for God. God the best they can. Some of you sitting here tonight, you'll say, well, I'm living the best I can. I've been trying to do the best I can. Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? Why am I having to go through this? Why am I being true? It's just not fair, God. You better watch it. That's a wicked spirit. David Livingston is in God's will. David Livingston, then they got out there, and, and I think she read this chapter, I'll read a chapter, and she'll read a chapter. And David, it was laying out there, they had to camp out. And you know what they'd do? They'd build a fire and lay just as close to that fire as they could to keep the animals and creatures. And in that, in that, in that river was alligators. Uh, I mean, a gator that can jump so they can jump and hear that pool pool. And they'd all like that. Snap your head off, just like that. They, they lay down at night and go to sleep. And when they woke up the next morning, he said their hands, he felt numb. And he said there's these little blue things, look like blueberries between all their fingers, hooked on to them. And he said, what in the world is this? And they said, it's Thomas, or T-A-M-A-U-S, that's all those, the words they use. And you know what that, that's our word for ticks. And he said it was in between all the fingers. And the head was buried in them. And they said, don't jerk them out. Don't pull them out. Because the head will stay in there and still drain you of your blood. And you'll get sick within a week and probably die. Or get terribly sick. I know most of them are trying to live for God, giving up their comforts of home, living for God, selling out to God, giving it all to God. You want to know us American Christians? The least no better problem, we flip our lid. The least no better problem, we're ready to quit. The least no better problem, we're ready to throw in the towel. Brother, the spirit of fairness is a wicked spirit. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, there ain't nothing been fair down here. Whoever said life was fair. They poured alcohol on them things. Where them ticks would finally get sick and pull their heads out of their fingers. And they said they got them snakes over there in Africa. Some of them they call them one steppers and two steppers and three steppers. That means if one of them bites you, you take two steps before you're dead. Black mamba. Son, you get you snake handlers up in Tennessee and everything. Yeah, you don't see them fooling with them things, buddy. One bite of them, you're gone. I think the church should do so and so, brother Danny. You better watch it because the spirit of fairness reveals the need to control the uncontrollable. One of our great ladies of our church made a statement. I'm not going to name her name. Some of you know who I'm talking about. This is a great lady with a lot of great wisdom. And somebody brought up the uh, question here a few years ago. They were just cutting up over here. Somebody had been divorced and uh, they was wanting to get married again. And uh, they was asking them what they're thinking about it. And they said, well, well uh, what do you think about that? And uh, they said, what do you think about that person getting married again? After being and this great lady who I have great respect for and a lot of great wisdom turned around and said, uh, I don't think it's fair for nobody to have two, but we all have one. 
I'll not call no names. That's what we call the spirit of fairness. Amen. Hey, listen, I've been pastor here 21 years. It ain't always been fair. You say, Brother Danny, I got to share. So am I. We all do. We all, that's life. It don't always have to be fair according to our eyes. Let God be God. Let God be what God going to do. Let God really show. Let God decide how to do this. And you'll be a whole lot better off. You won't be the elder brother out pouting while the others are enjoying the party. Amen. Amen. Um, I think the, somebody told me there's no, our school's starting in a few weeks. Listen to me. There is no way under God's heaven everybody's going to be satisfied. You might as well brace yourself right now. We ain't going to have school that everybody's going to be satisfied. You say, well, I want my kids out there. Well, we'll do everything we can. I know that man there, his wife, our staff, we're committed to do everything we can to make that school the best we can possibly make it. Then you say, well, it's not fair. 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 You better just leave it up to God. Let God live. We'll do the best we can to serve God and just enjoy it the best you can. I say this to some, some of mad at me anyway. I'd, I'd put my school, I'd, I'd put my kid in a Christian school where they at least taught about God even where it wasn't perfect. Before I'd put them in a school that teaches them they come from monkeys. And you're, hey, you say, I went one point we got mad and said, well, I'm preaching this stuff. Well, at least I repented and got right. That'll allow lesbians to teach. And not even change the lifestyle. Amen. Preach that brother. Hey, life ain't always fair. But let the Father do what the Father's going to do. You know, one man uh, I was talking to recently, and I was talking to some other, well, I talked to one of our teachers. And there's, uh, as of now, there's been no teachers said as far as grades, and all we're going to know that in the next couple of weeks. Well, there's a who's the teacher. We'll let you know when we know. But uh, one teacher spoke to me and had this attitude. One teacher told me recently, they said, Brother Danny, you and Brother Robbie talk it over. They said, if you need me, I'm available. I'll do what I can to help the school. If you don't need me, just count me out. It won't hurt my feelings. And I'll do whatever God would have me to do. You know what I call that? I call that great maturity in a Christian. I call that great, I have great respect for a person who has such an attitude as that. I knew a lady in the church down the road, I won't name what church, she got mad one time because they wasn't going to let her teach her Sunday school class and she didn't get the class she wanted to teach and she got mad and she said, well I'll just quit the church if I don't get to teach the class that I want to teach. That lady shouldn't be teaching class. She should be in the nursery sucking a bottle. Amen? Amen. Listen, brother, you got to read the spirit of fairness is ruled by a person who wants to control the uncontrollable. You know what this thing done to me here in the last few weeks? I give our church to God more than I ever had before. I always thought like, felt like, boy, I've got to do this. And I you know what I found out? I can't straighten nobody out. I can't do nothing. All I can do is be right with God. All I can do is have my heart clean. All I can do is do my best to live for Him. And brother, it's His church. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. He'll watch over it. And if we'll all get that attitude and just let the Father do what the Father wants to do, everything will be all right. And we'll rejoice at His house one of these days. Let's, let's, uh, Divert from our story of the prodigal son here just a minute. And let me show you this truth in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Let me show you how God in the Bible is not always fair. Matthew chapter 20. I didn't say God's sin. I said God isn't always fair. And you better thank God for it. Matthew chapter 20. I've always wondered about this myself. 
I'll show you a place in Matthew 20. You tell me if you think this is fair. Come on now, 20th century American, 21st, whatever you are. Kingdom of heaven, verse 1, is like a man as a householder, went out early in the morning to hire laborers. And verse 2, he had agreed. So they had agreement for the laborers for a penny a day. He sent them in his vineyard. He went out the third hour, people standing around. He hired them. And he told them, verse 4, whatever is right, I will give you. Sound fair enough? Whatever is right, I'll give you. And they said, okay, they agreed. He went out to six, and the ninth hour and did likewise. Verse six, and about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and said, why stand ye here all the day idle? And he said, because no man have hired us. And he said, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that ye shall receive. Fine. Everything seemed fine. He started some early in the morning. He started some about nine o'clock. He started some about twelve o'clock. He three and five and six. Right that evening. Some of them went to work, but they all come back to payday. And boy, did the fur hit the fan then. Verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. And when they were come, they that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed. Remember what I said a minute ago about your opinion, and I think I, it should be this way. And I, they said, now wait a minute here. Hold it right here. They supposed that they should receive more, and they likewise received every man a penny. Look here, verse 11. And when they had received it, what did they do? They murmured against the goodman of the house. They went over to one of them's houses that evening and said, He's not fair. This ain't right. I don't care what anybody says, this ain't right. I worked all day long, and all he paid me was a penny. Them sorry bums come in, and they worked an hour, and he gave them a penny. It ain't fair. To be honest with you, if I read that story in any other book beside the Bible, I'd say the same thing. That ain't fair. I say, I don't think it's fair. Do you? you you're scared to say no because you think you're going... But deep down inside, does, does that sound fair? No, it don't, does it? Does it? You're scared still scared. You see, you're thinking you're blaspheme or something. If you, I, 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 The truth is, that man agreed to pay him a penny. That was the agreement made. As God does something, we don't always think fair. But God, He makes the rules. God's done some things before. Or I thought, now why didn't you do that, Lord? I prayed for this and this and this and this. And, it, and deep down inside, I said, something don't seem right about this. They murmured against the goodman of the house. Saying, these guys didn't work but one hour, and you have made them equal to us. And he said in verse, 10, verse 13, Friend, I do thee no wrong. They want to control by their own personal opinion. They murmured against the goodman of the house. Don't sound fair to me, but they're the ones that agreed to the penny. At the dinner table, they talked to their relatives and kids about it. Their kids grew up hating that man. He's not done my daddy wrong. He made him work all day long and didn't give him a penny. And these other dudes come in with the hour and they got a penny too. I don't like that man. Did you know, did you know I can tell in the church, and I'm not talking about just our recent situation. I've known that for 20 years. I can tell the people in the church that don't like me because of their kids' attitude toward me. Your kids' attitude toward me is always your attitude toward me. Because the kids hear the parents talk. 
And the kids pick up the spirit and the attitude from the kids or from the parents. If the parents respect God and the parents believe the Bible and the parents respect, it's the same way the school and the teacher. If you'll back up and support that school teacher and that principal and that administrator, your kids will. But if you're dumb enough to sit around the dinner table and criticize the faculty, you need to ask God to get that spirit of fairness out of you and say, God, Help me with that. Things don't always seem fair. You say, what are we going to do? Live with it. Or kill yourself. Take your choice. And I'm not telling you to do that. I'm saying that's the only two choices you've got. Life ain't always fair. Isn't it strange that the kids have the same attitude as the parents? I think, uh, I'm, this is off the message, but I think you are very unwise, unspiritual, and about half nuts to sit around and criticize the people you go to church with or your church in front of your children. Man, how dumb can you get? I mean, if, anybody, if they got a problem with their kids, some school, me and my wife will talk it over, and I'll talk it over to their teacher or their administrator, and my kids will never hear a word out of it from me. Amen? That's the spirit of fairness. You say, well, I don't think I'm getting what I deserve. Let's turn to Luke chapter 3 and let me show you another verse and then we'll get back to our story. Luke chapter number 3. Luke chapter 3, let me show you something. This is for all you adults. Some of you are miserable all the time because you think you don't make enough money. You gripe all the time because you've been at the factory long as that other fellow has and he's making more money than you are or he got a promotion that you didn't get and some of you make yourself miserable because you don't make enough money according to your opinion. According to yourself, you just don't make enough money, do you? Let me show you what John the Baptist told him guys to get ready for Jesus. John the Baptist, Luke chapter 3 and verse number 14. And the soldiers also demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and what? Be content with your wages. Ugh. That's one of them weapons, ain't it? Did you know you're supposed to just sit home and think, I just thank God that I'm making the money that I'm making. You ought to see the looks on people's faces in here than that. Some of y'all sitting there going, no, no, no. I deserve more. I deserve more. I should make more money. They're not paying me enough. They're not paying me enough. Hey, man, you know what that is? That's that spirit of fairness that all the brother had, and it's not of God. The Bible said, be content with your wages. Thank God you're getting more than you deserve. Sure you are. You see how you make yourself miserable when you let the spirit of fairness rule your life? You're making yourself miserable. Sitting around gripping ain't going to put a penny in your pocket. Sitting around gripping ain't going to get you a raise. So I want to make $300. Well, I don't think we ought to make more. I think we ought to make more. You know how much you got in your pocket? $300. You know what's better do? Lord, I probably don't deserve this and thank you for this and I appreciate it and I know it ain't much and help me to do better and give me another better job if it ain't, if it you will, but if it ain't, I'm going to be content with what you give me. Not only that, number three, the spirit of fairness is a selfish desire to compare yourself with somebody else. He's comparing him to his other brother. You know what he said? He said, I've served you all these years. Oh, listen at him now. Listen to him. And never have at any time transgressed thy commandment. Lord, have mercy getting a little self-righteous, ain't we? Did you know what that boy said? He said, I've been here all these years and I ain't never done nothing wrong against you, Daddy. You believe that? I don't. 
That's the spirit of fairness. When you start thinking, well, oh, so and so ain't never living like a devil, and I've never done nothing wrong. You the ones who are the devil. Amen. 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 I'm telling you, brother, it breeds criticism. It is wrong. He said, I've served you all these years, and I have never transgressed that commandment. I don't believe for a second that boy lived all them years and never transgressed his father's commandment. Guarantee you he broke his father's word every now and then. Amen. And he said, all these many years. That was a funny word. He said, I've served you all these many. He said, Daddy, I've served you a long time. Now, it don't seem that long if you do it for love. Sound like he's just waiting on his daddy to die to get his inheritance. Jacob loved, what's her name? Um, Rachel. And he... Seven years worked for her, and it seemed just a few days for the love. That I got to thinking about me being pastor 21 years, and I got to think about it. Don't seem like that long. One way of looking at it, it seems like 10,000, but another way it just seems like just a few days. You know why? Because I love it. I love the church. I love the Lord. I love my God. I wouldn't want to do nothing else with my life except preach. I'd just soon be dead if I wasn't going to be a preacher. It don't seem as long if you're, if you're serving for love. It seems like it takes forever if you're doing it out of obligation. Amen. Well, I think the church should have done this. And I think the church should have done that. There's no way you can please everybody. And you better watch that spirit of, quote, fairness. I told you the other day, somebody said, why? But, you know, we had to put on some more deacons for a crisis. And then someone said, well, I thought so said, Billy. Tell me, man, you want to be a deacon? We'll let you be a deacon. <laughs> it ain't no kids. Come on, man, tell me. So I want to be a deacon. You'll get over it. Hey, man, just thank God. Yeah, it's a spirit of fairness swelling up in you. It is a selfish desire to compare yourself with someone else. It breeds criticism. Somebody said this. I don't think it's fair. The church. You better watch that kind of attitude. You better let God and His Word decide what's fair or not. Look, I could go back in my life and tell you things happened to me that I personally don't think I deserved. Would you? Would you? If if I wouldn't embarrass some people tonight, I could go back through over the years and tell you some things people's done to me and said about me and them things. And I can I can tell you some stuff where I've been treated like dirt, friend. Like dirt. I could do it. Be easy. And I could say, It's not fair, God. I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to live for you. I can't do that. You know why? Because the spirit of fairness is a selfish spirit. I'd just be thinking about myself if I acted like that and try to complain about how bad I've been treated. Let me ask you a question tonight. Did Jesus Christ ever sin? Yes or no? Did He deserve to die on the cross? Was it fair? No. Was it fair that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died? That wasn't fair, was it? God don't always do things fair according to the way we look at it. And you better be glad he don't. If that would have been us, we would have said, No, sir, that's not fair. My son's never come into sin. He's 32 and a half years old. He's real perfect. They're the ones that sin. Let them die and go to hell. But not God. Thank God, not our Father. He don't operate like that. He let the innocent die for the guilty. He let the innocent. You say, well, I'll never go apologize to so and so. They hurt my feelings. Did you know sometimes the offender should apologize to the offended? We was guilty. We deserved hell. We deserved to burn forever. He didn't deserve nothing. But he hung and died. Was it fair? No. But thank God you got let 
it happen for us. It wasn't fair. I want to ask you another question. Be honest. A man lives 40 years in sin, and then he dies and burns in hell for billions and billions. Does that sound fair to you? Really, it don't, does it? Not really. Come on, be honest. I mean, outside the Bible, I know God's, don't, don't sit there and look at me like, I'm saying, I know God's right, I know God's ways are equal, I know God always does what's right, but it don't seem fair in our minds. You cannot question the way God handles things. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything. He's sovereign. Don't ever question God's judgment on things. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In other words, listen, listen to me. In other words, things don't have to always seem to be fair in order for it to be God's will or to be right. Do you hear me? Things don't always have to, quote, seem fair for it to be God's will to be right. Some things to us, they say it don't seem fair, preacher. And I say, I agree with you, don't. But thank God, He knows what's best, and He'll do what's best. Somebody said, earth's the place for trust. Heaven's a place for understanding. There's a lot of things down here we just got to trust God with. You never will understand until you get there. You've got to realize the prodigal son had lost his inheritance. He lost every good thing he's ever going to get. And I understand that. And then you're going to see the real real picture. The prodigal son had done blood his inheritance. He lost everything he had. He got to just live in the father's house. God was good. Or the father was good to him. He put the robe around him. Put the ring on his finger. Killed a fatty cat. He made a big party for him. And everything seemed wonderful. But that boy lost something he'd never get back. He lost his inheritance, and the other brother had his coming, but his other brother just got mad about it because he was having a big shin big for him right then. Amen? That's the truth of the story. Let me say one a couple more things, and I'll be through. The spirit of fairness is a spirit that demands for payment for that which is deserved. See, in our head, we think, they deserve this! My child deserves that. I deserve this. The spirit of fairness is something that makes us think that we should always get what we deserve. You know what he came? When the prodigal son came back home, he said, I don't deserve to live in the father's house. Just make me as one of your hired servants. I'll just live in the servants' quarters. I'll just be like a slave. I don't live in the mansion. I just eat bread and beans and butter on it and, and, and drink and eat soup and drink water. Oh, yeah. he, he just said, that's all I deserve. But the Father gave him the room. The Father gave him the way. The Father gave him the fatted cat. The Father gave him much, much, much more than he deserved. And I want to say to you tonight, listen, we're getting much, 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 much more than we deserve. Somebody told me the other day, he said, You don't deserve the pay. I said, You're absolutely right. I just don't. You don't deserve it. You don't sit in the church neither. Thank God He's blessed us so much that He gives us more than what we deserve. Let me ask you a question. Do you really want God to be fair with you? I don't think you do. I don't think you do. The secret of serving God is to come to God asking, expecting no special treatment, no special blessings, and just say, God, how whatever you can do for me and give me, I sure would appreciate it. Don't ever come to God like, I deserve this. The elder brother said, I've served you all these years, and I deserve a party. You give a party for the younger brother, and he's been out living like a devil, and you give him a big party, and I don't get no party. Don't ever come to God with an attitude like, I deserve better than this. The way to serve God 
is you come to God and you say, God, I don't deserve one bit of I'm going to be honest with you a minute and I'm through. When you have that spirit of fairness, you limit God in what He wants to do. You limit God in what He wants to do. Listen to me. Everybody listen. When that party was going on and they was all in there having a good time with music and singing and dancing and all kind of stuff like that, the father wanted that elder brother to be in there enjoying that. And he limited what the father wanted him to have. A lot of people get cheated. You listen? A lot, of, a lot of kids get cheated out of youth camp, Christian school. A lot of parents get cheated. You cheat yourself when you limit God on what He wants to do for you. He said, come on in, enjoy the party. No, I'm not going to do it. It's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? Well, you're not living like a devil and you get my party. Come on in, man. Get steak. Get you some, get your hamburger. Get you some french fries. Get you a piece of cake. Enjoy the party. Nope. Not fair. The spirit of fairness limits what the Father wants to do for you. His mercies are new every morning. Thank God. He's not always fair with us. I want to show you a verse of Scripture. I believe it's in Ezekiel. If you'll look over there just in a second and I'm closing. Good night. I don't know where it's at in Ezekiel. I think I marked it. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter 18. If you'll look at this, I'll be through. Ezekiel chapter 18. What I'm saying to you tonight is things don't always have to be fair in your eyes, in my eyes. God's done some things sometimes I thought, well, that's not fair. It's just not fair. And you know who winds up getting cheated? I do. You let God do what God's going to do and then He'll bless you and you'll get in on the party. Ezekiel 18, 25. And I'll read this and I'm through. Yet ye say, these people said, the way of the Lord is not equal. They said, this ain't right, God. The way you're doing it, you're not handling this right. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when that wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, that which he hath committed, and did that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one of you according to his way, saith the Lord. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so as that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgression, whereby you have transgressed to make a new heart and new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. God saying, I don't want you to die. I don't want you to ruin your life in sin. I want to have mercy on you. And I want to bless you. And I want to give you what you don't deserve. Mercy. Mercy. The spirit of fairness will get you in trouble. He said, it's not fair. You better thank God it ain't. You better say, God, I don't want what I deserve. I want your mercy. Because the spirit of fairness. I got my Strong's Concordance and checked every place in the King James Bible. And the word fair is not mentioned one time in connection in the context that I've used it tonight. 
Every time the word fire is mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about the other way of using fire, like uh, the son, the daughters of Job were fair, uh, uh, pretty, or this he was uh, a fair countenance, that kind of fair. There is not one place in the King James Bible where the word fair is mentioned. Like we say, it's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. That ain't a doctrine of the Bible, and you better thank God it ain't. You don't serve God because of fairness. You serve Him because of His mercy and His love. Let's stand with our heads bowed. The truth is tonight, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, the truth is tonight, while every head is bowed and every eye closed, let's say, God, your will be done. He said, my husband's not treating me fair. You better watch that kind of attitude. My mom and daddy's not fair, Brother Danny. They won't let me go. Other people get to go out and stay out till 11 o'clock, and they won't let me go. And my mama won't let me go there. Teenager, you better watch that attitude. That spirit of fairness is not of the right spirit. You better let mom and daddy make those decisions and respect those decisions. No way God's going to give you everything you want. His ways are equal. His ways are right. In our eyes, His ways are not fair as we see it. Many's come to the altar already. Maybe you need to come pray about something tonight. Maybe you need to come get your life right with God. You say, well, I just don't think it's fair. You're doing just like the elder brother. I haven't been treated right. Well, you just better thank God you're not being treated like you deserve. We're nothing but a bunch of sinners saved by His grace. God, have mercy on us tonight. God, we know that if it were not for Your mercy that we'd all be in hell or on our way. Please, 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 in Jesus' name, have mercy on New Man of Baptist Church, on this poor preacher, on our school, on our camp. Please shed mercy on us, O oh God. We're not asking for what's fair in our eyes. We're asking for mercy. We want to join in on whatever you decide to do. We want to be a part of the moving of your spirit. Don't let us be stubborn or selfish or demand our own way or things don't always have to go the way we want them to. God, take that spirit out of us. Lord, in our bus workers, in our Sunday school teachers, in our workers, in our school, in our church, in our choir, in our, our in any, any part of our church, Lord, help us to get to the point where we say, May your will be done and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing, girl. Amen. You come if you need to come. Come on, right now. You protect Somebody oh. All right, everybody sing now. Angels are watching, everybody. Angels are watching.
now Well, I talk to bear and witness Yes, amen 